and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and with me to discuss the latest royal news is the Mail on Sunday's assistant editor Kate Manzi and the Daily Mail's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome to you both and welcome to all our new viewers who joined us during our week of special episodes. We've been getting loads of comments and questions and we'll be looking at those later in the show. First up, King Charles is taking a rest after a whirlwind few days following the death of the Queen. In her column this week, the Daily Mail's Sarah Vine looked at what would be at the top of the King's to-do list when he came back. I think he's got a lot of work to do. He's got to sort out the Harry and Meghan situation because I don't think the truce is a truce. I think it was just for the cameras. I, there doesn't seem to be any... There's, I'm not hearing anything good about Harry, actually. I'm, I, you know, I, I, he was... He, he's, I know a few people who are around Charles and they all say the same thing, which is that he's acting up and that it's not really a very good situation. So that needs to be resolved because he'll go back to America and he'll publish this book and goodness knows what will be in it. But, you know, the sort of one, the, you know, the Queen was the buffer between that happening. And so that's a real problem. I think Andrew is also a problem, slightly less a problem because, like, he doesn't have a massive social media following. He doesn't have a huge fan base. So, and he's quite low, he's actually quite low, low profile, but he does need to work out what to do about him. And I think I think this idea of slimming down the monarchy is something that he needs to get on with, really. I think also the coronation is a big question, because I think if we're going into a very difficult winter, um, sort of, you know, optics of, of, of opulence are quite hard to sell to the British public. There will be a lot of people who will take this opportunity now that the Queen has gone to, you know, lay into the monarchy and to question whether it even deserves to exist anymore. I think it would be wrong to think that the great outpouring of love that we saw last week was necessarily for the monarchy. I think it was very much for the Queen. And so I think those who take the monarchy on need to understand that and they need to find their own value, they need to show their own value. And I think Charles needs to do that. Camilla is going to be key. Uh, she is brilliant. Um, and actually, she is, funny enough, also one of those women who's sort of indestructible. I mean, she's, I think in a funny kind of way, she's much more resilient than he is. She's much easier, to, she's much more easygoing, she's less anxious, she's more confident, uh, she's, she's not somebody, she is who she is, she's very, she's, very, um, she's very comfortable in her skin. And I'm not sure that Prince Charles is particularly, or ever really was, and I think he's, you know, always had a, always had a difficult role to, to fill, really. So Camilla will be key, and I think that um, she will she will really support him in all of this, and she'll be his you know she'll be she'll be his rock, and she does model herself a bit on Prince Philip, so you know hopefully that'll be a good relationship. Kate Manzi, Sarah, there saying that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex will be at the top of the King's in tray. Do you think that's the case? Well, the King might be wise to have take some advice from Sarah Vine, I would say, because <laughs> if he's a sensible man, that really should be the first thing, because that's the thing that could derail his whole reign, really. You know, if you've got the Sussexes throwing bombs from, from California and... They've but got how do you control that? Well, that's it. I mean, I think open lines of communication might be a good way to start with that. Um, but from all my knowledge of Charles and um, seeing him through the years, I. I think he'll be focused more on the, the tasks at hand of, you know, the, the duties that he sees top of the entry, you know, who is he going to visit, which of the realms will he visit first, um, getting to grips with his weekly audiences with the Prime Minister and all the things that will be front and foremost of his mind, perhaps rightly so. When you think about the bigger picture and the stabilising kind of, you know, what is important for the monarchy is this kind of smooth transition into the new reign, I think it would be wise to to try to have some sort of meaningful communication w with Harry because you know we've still got so many things to come. We've got the book, we've got Meghan's podcast, which have been postponed, not cancelled, and various other you know perhaps flies in the ointment for the new king. I do wonder, Richard, if what the appetite is across the pond for any reconciliation, any any smoothing over. We have uh, the journalist in America, Gail King, who seems to be some sort of unofficial voice piece for the Sussexes, saying that there was no peace deal struck while they were here. What, what do you make of that? 
Yeah, I mean, barely had they returned to California, and already we heard from their friend, Gail King. Mm. She's the one, a friend of Oprah Winfrey. She came over at the time of their wedding and has been, seems to have been pretty closely in touch with them. So I think we can assume that what she says is reliable. But remember, they came over, they didn't have any plans to see the royal family. They came over for charity events, and then the Queen died while they were in Britain. So it wasn't really a time for, you know, negotiations or whatever. But perhaps they were hoping there'd be some sort of move from Prince Charles. You know, we saw an olive branch from him um, in terms of referencing them in his um, the speech he made after his mother's death. Um, and perhaps they were hoping that there'd be some kind of offer to bring them back into the fold, give mm. them what they always wanted, which was the chance to mix um, a commercial activities with carrying out some engagements for the royal family. And Jenny Murray was writing in her column, Kate, that she said that the royals will regret choosing to humiliate Harry. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Well, I thought that was a really interesting piece, actually, because, um, we're, you know, the British press has always been considered to be knocking Meghan and Harry. And here was Jenny Murray saying, well, actually, they should have let him wear his uniform. And I've spoken to qu quite a lot of people who have that point of view. But, yeah. You know, I have to say, the royal family, you know, there are privileges, but there are responsibilities that come with those privileges. If you step away from it, they are the rules. They were the rules that the Queen decreed um, before she died. And I'm sorry, but it, it seems that that's, that's what the palace is sticking with. I mean, it was a sad sight, wasn't it, seeing um, Harry have to bow his head rather than salute um, his grandmother's coffin, seeing him in his civvies. But as you say, he knew that. That's what happens when you give up royal duties. So he made that choice. And... and they made that choice quite quickly. There were all those discussions, weren't there, with Sir Edward Young, the Queen's private secretary at the time. And that could have been... They could have spent time just negotiating that. But the Sussexes put out that shock statement, which sparked what's now... We, we know as the Sandringham Summit. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the start of a very quick... Um, process, you know, the Queen ordered her aides to come to, to sort some sort of solution at pace. Um, that they were her words, uh, because of the way that it had come about. And I think had they taken a bit more time, maybe they'd be in a situation where both sides might be happier. Do you think it's very interesting, and I think rather telling in an ominous way, the Sussexes have barely touched back down on American soil, and we've already had a little bit of a snippet of their, you know, their, their opinions via Gail King. Do you, it, it seems to me that Jenny Murray might be right, that in humiliating Harry, he just can't wait to talk about this whole episode a lot more. Yeah, but come on, they sort of want to be humili humiliated, don't they, in the sense that Charles did things like another ol olive branch was, you know, letting Harry, asking Harry to wear his uniform for this vigil of the, the mm. grandchildren by the coffin. And then that backfired. Then we suddenly heard these stories about how um, he was unhappy that he wasn't able to have the ER on his shoulder of his coat like Prince William was. So mm. e even things like that can be thrown back in the face of, of the, the, the royals of King Charles. What do you think go going forward the context will be, Richard, you know, the, the Queen and Prince Philip apparently used to divide their roles. The Queen was state, Philip was head of the family. You can't really, a king, the king will be head of the state. No one's, that, those boys won't accept Camilla as the head of the family. So what do you think is going to happen there? It, it is very difficult. I mean, mm. the, the Queen and Prince Philip had that really strong, wonderful partnership where he could kind of be head of the family while she was head of state. And it did seem to work quite effectively. Often it was a sort of good cop, bad cop, you know, with Prince Philip doing, making the difficult decisions that perhaps she could say, oh, that's, that's Philip's decision. Mm. Whereas that's not an option that's open to King Charles at all. Camilla has really no authority over William or certainly not Harry. And from what we're hearing, um, certainly there's new book by Angela Levin, which I think we're going to mention earlier, where she talks about, you know, quite a lot of animosity towards um, Camilla from, from Harry. So the idea of her being able to um, suggest things, yeah. if anything, she would stay well clear to avoid making things worse. Oh, I wonder if that's a role to, that, that William might actually step into, that William might be the person to come and kind of sort the Ooh. family out a bit more. 
Um, because I think Charles... That seems rather imbalanced, though, from Harry's point of view, doesn't it? Well, I think Char yeah. the job will fall to him eventually anyway, and Charles doesn't like confrontation. He would rather rule by consent rather than decree, as someone described it to me within the palace, that he wants people to get on, but he's not... He'd rather bury himself in the work and the matters of state rather than deal with the more thorny issue yeah. of um, I think maybe Princess Charlotte could sort them all out. Well, oh, brilliant. She seems she's great. Enough. She's been great. And we've seen yeah. her giving some directions <laughs> to her old, older brother. So, yeah. How well did she do? She was just, and, and, and Prince George, they were just shining examples, weren't they? they Love, uh, during the funeral, I think they were. Oh, they were just tremendous. Very cute. Brilliant. Come on, it yeah. wasn't just so one well service, behaved. but it yes. was two, wasn't it? And they, I thought they did so they well. They survived the but whole thing. Let's talk about the royal's other favourite son, Andrew, will be also be in the king's in trade. There seems to be a feeling in the family, and I think probably in the public, that he can't be a worker. King Royal. What, how to solve a problem like Andrew? What will the King do? Well, there were those statements that came out a few uh, weeks or months before the Queen passed and it was about how they were going to be supporting Andrew to find a new role away from the public gaze. Away! <laughs> and it was the away from the public gaze part of that statement which is really interesting. But he does need to have some sort of role um, and it'd be wise to give him something, but what that might be is, uh, again, that's going to be a bit of a headache for Charles, for, for the new king. There was another story that has generated some interest, um, the idea that Andrew lobbied to be Prince Regent, a la instead of having King Charles. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, so this is from Angela Levin's new biography of Camilla. Angela Levin is someone that we've had on this programme several times and it, it's very interesting because it's a book. I think she has had some cooperation from, from the palace. So, you know, I'm really reading it with close interest. Mm. And she, let's be clear, this is very old. This is um, going back to when Charles and Diana's marriage was breaking down. And I, I must say, I've heard over the years that Andrew and Fergie, um, Duke and Duchess of York, they were convinced that they would become king and queen. I just, that just sounds like completely made up. No. So, no disrespect to the writer of this book, but yeah. have you ever heard anything more extraordinary? No, that's the thing. It sounds absurd, <laughs> but I'm genuinely told by people who knew them very well that they did think it was the case. Now, it's not clear exactly why, but remember, this was that febrile time when, you know, Diana was convinced that Charles would never be king, I think. Things were so bad between Diana and Charles that there was a sort of feeling at the time, could he really ever be king? And I think Andrew... It, it appears, certainly from Angela Levin's book, that he sort of played on that and at that time was convinced, you know, that he could step into the role and perhaps be a sort of Prince Regent, keeping the throne warm for um, a young Prince William. But, Maybe somewhere in a parallel um, universe. I mean, wow, when we look back yeah. at all the controversies that have happened since then, it really is. Let's just say it was a lucky escape. I think that might be a new Netflix series for somebody just to imagine that whole <laughs> No, no, please, lineage. please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start writing that. But, Richard, I, I do want to speak to you about Prince Andrew's living arrangements in a moment. But before we do that, I want to turn to a couple of comments we've received recently from some of you, our lovely viewers. We've been really overwhelmed with the nice things you've been saying to us. And one or two of them have really made us laugh, though. And this is the first one we want to share, which came from a tweet from someone who just calls themselves, oh, dear, who replied to this picture of Richard, Andrew Pierce, and me saying... This picture looks like dinner with the in-laws after you've just told them you're going to divorce their daughter. <laughs> now, I want to know which in that scenario is who's who in this scenario. Have you figured it out, Richard? Are you, am um, I married to you and well, you're divorcing me? No, I think me? you and Andrew Pierce might be the parents in this scenario. Oh, so that's um, it. great. Good that you think I look old <laughs> enough to be your mum, but cheers for that. It's like... Andrew's face and that makes the picture really, doesn't it, when you see the comment underneath. Come on, to be fair, this was the programme that we recorded after the Queen's funeral. So, so we, we, were all were, we all were looking somber. rather stern. Yeah, but the second is this fantastic exchange between Bonnie Frank and Tab Ford on who would make a better next-door neighbour. Listen to this, Richard or Andrew Pearce. Now, Richard, Richard Eden would be the best next-door neighbour, such a truly nice man. Well, we know that's not true, don't we? He'd definitely take in your mail and check on your cats. Yes, I bet he'd bring over some bread or cookies he'd just made too. He's so polite and respectful. And then Tab says, I have to confess that Andrew Pierce is my personal favourite. Andrew would wear a tie for brunch and he adopts cats from rescue centres. He also tells it like it is. If you trampled on his flower beds, he'd call you out on it. <laughs> so he can live on the other side of Bonnie. Now... 
how can we do we know who's the best neighbor out of you and Andrew? Well, I'm pleased that people follow us so closely, but it's definitely true that Andrew, I think, does adopt cats from rescue centers. Um, well, I, I don't live next door to Andrew, but I'm sure um, <laughs> b both, both of us are, are good neighbors. Um, no, no mention of me. I guess you probably all realise I'd be an absolutely well, dreadful Well, no, I, th I was just thinking, dreadful. who would I rather live next to door to? And I think it would be you, Joe. I'd be going around to see if I can borrow your lovely blazers and some of your jewellery and things okay, like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, perhaps right. we should so go I would on, pick you. Yeah. Perhaps we should go on tour together, you know? Hmm. I don't know. Let's not get too far. Yeah, I don't know about that. But anyway, well, anyway, let's, let's move on. But do keep commenting and sharing the programme. We'll answer a couple of your questions in just a few minutes and stick around for that. But following what we were just discussing about Prince Andrew, there are some reports, Richard, new reports about where he might end up living. Yes, there was a report today um, in, the, in the Sun newspaper, which was slightly annoying because it was a story that I was planning to run. Um, but You've it been was. Scooped, the, I, th I think I have, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, that. Um, Andrew was always um, aware that he was expecting to move out of Royal Lodge um, once Charles was king. He thought that when the houses were, all the palaces and the houses were reallocated, um, he kind of assumed that Charles would want him to move out. But the story in The Sun was making clear that um, Andrew and, let's be clear, the Duchess of York, who also lives under the same roof at Royal Lodge, have been Cozy. sort of, they've been given a reprieve in the sense that they can continue to stay there. It just said for some time, so it's not clear how long. Mm. But remember that Andrew and Fergie um, did something very clever because they gave the Queen um, some dogs, the corgis, and the, on the basis that they would take them back um, if the Queen couldn't look after them. So they're now the ones look after the, looking after those dogs. So surely the King can hardly evict um, the Queen's dogs. So I, I think that Andrew and Fergie are as safe as long as those dogs are alive. Sure, everyone would follow that line of logic, Richard, but OK. When the yeah. Queen Mother died, Andrew did get the lease, so he still has quite a long time to run on that lease. The problem, I think, will be is that, and this might be Charles's argument ultimately to, to get him out of Royal Lodge, is that if he can't afford um, to keep up you know, the refurbishments and all the money that need... I mean, this place is vast. It's sprawling. Well, this I was gonna, it's, it's called Royal Lodge. But it's big and for yeah, two non-working you know, royals. Sounds cosy, but actually it's not. Yeah. I mean, there, there are quarters where the police can, can live because there are huge security kind of gates at the front. There's a swimming pool. Um, let's remember this is where Princess Beatrice got married. So they have a little chapel within the grounds. They have um, just vast kind of... Uh, there's a vast mansion, but there are also outhouses. I mean... It would be the perfect place for, well, I don't know, Prince and Princess of Wales and their three children, for example. Well, this is what I was going to ask, because haven't Kate and William just moved into a much smaller cottage, Adelaide cottage? Surely they would be the more deserving beneficiary of a bigger royal lodge. What well, that's think? why it's just all so sensitive, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> that, um, can you imagine? I mean, you know, King Charles has got enough on his plate now, but having to decide all these... Um, questions about housing. But I thought that when King Charles came in, we were going to have all these sweeping, you know, smaller royal family reforms. I thought that was going to be a right old axe. Well, well, g give him a chance. You know, he's only been king for a week, hasn't oh, been cra yeah. crowned yet. Yeah. Well, it has kind of naturally it's not, it's slimmed down. It's not a good down. look, though, is it? It's just not a good look. And um, particularly now when people are feeling the pinch, yeah. I think that's really kind of front and foremost on his mind that, you know, how can the royal family be spending so much money on all these different homes and houses when, you know, the ordinary people are really, really struggling to pay bills. Um, so I think that's going to be a big, a big thing. And someone said within the palace to me that he, a plan might be to open up Balmoral um, and have that uh, as yes. a museum. So make these buildings more work better for the communities they serve. Um, so Buckingham Palace having that more open, yes, he will still have what was described to me as a kind of flat above the shop there, um, you know, living yeah. quarters, but that it'd be more open to the public. Same with Balmoral. Wouldn't it be extraordinary to go to visit Balmoral, have a great exhibition up there for the late Queen? It was a place that she loved, um, you know, where she spent her final days. I think that would be mm. a, a truly wonderful way to kind of mark, mark her, her I reign. should say I'm a bit sceptical about these reports of, you know, when, um, when Charles talks about the slimmed down monarchy, he was referring to the, the members of it, really, which was going to be him, not, not William and family, but, but not the houses. <laughs> Ch yeah. Charles does not like losing houses. He's acquired various ones. There's 
Dumfries House, the um, you know amazing um, stately home that he. Well, that know, has a social rescued. responsibility arm, though, um, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, but yeah. I think only one man has the keys, and that's yeah. him. Yeah. Um, he bought that from the Marquis of Butte. When the Queen Mother dies, um, the only private property that she had was the Castle of May. Well, he didn't want to lose that. So they sort of put that in a trust and they've had to have a charity kind of keeping that one. So I'm very sceptical about the idea they're going to be getting rid of any property. So you were talking earlier about perhaps some of the King's houses being turned into museums or tourist exhibitions, but a lot of his houses run by charities haven't always been amazingly run. Is that fair? Well, yeah, I mean, we've still got um, investigations going on about the Prince's Foundation, which is based at Dumfries House, which is that Ayrshire uh, mansion that you mentioned, Richard. So uh, uh, what's going to happen to his charities? That's going to be in his intray as well. How are they going to do it? And he even mentioned that in the first address to the nation, if you remember, that that's something he's going to have to take a step back from. So there's going to have to be a big organisation or reorganisation of all of, all of those properties and how they're going to work will be really interesting as well. Now, you were saying that he doesn't like to lose houses and he's very keen on his properties, wouldn't we all be? But surely there'll be some pressure in a cost of living and a housing crisis for that to be examined. True, um, and he's got houses as well. In there's some in Romania, um, there's there's some in Wales. He's got them in Scilly Isles. Um, but the thing is that, the, like the Duchy of Cornwall, that um, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, has just inherited, has you know vast numbers of properties. So it, it's not an easy one to address. You know, there's Sandringham that has, I think it's about 300 properties that are rented out. So um, wh where do you start? You know, even if Balmoral's turned into a, a museum, um, then that still remains a royal residence, presumably. Um, you know, so we wait with bated breath, really, to see what um, the king decides. We've just got time for a couple of questions now from viewers. The first is from Shane, who asks, does King Charles take over the care of all his mother's horses? Does anyone know the answer to that? My understanding is that, yes, they do go to King Charles. Um, who will who will continue to keep them Be in out the there, mucking out the stables as well on his in-tray? <laughs> I can't imagine he's doing that. No. But no doubt he'll keep the stables going. And Camilla's a very good rider. Well, does, does the king like horses? You never really hear about his passion oh, yeah. for horses in the same way as oh, you did the yes. queen. He, he used to love fox he, hunting. He used to be certainly a marvellous rider, very, very accomplished polo player. And you'll remember that's where the famous anecdote comes from, because he had an accident fell off the horse, hurt his arm, and that's where this kind of legendary uh, anecdote comes from, that Michael Fawcett, his longtime valet, um, was squeezing toothpaste onto his toothbrush for him because he couldn't do it because of this polo oh. accident. Now, whether that was true or not, no one, I don't think, has ever categorically uh, got to the bottom of. But no, he was an excellent, excellent rider. Yeah. But remember thought, what yeah. we're talking about here. We're not just talking about a few horses or the Queen's fell pony, Emma, that we saw, you know, oh. wait, waiting for yeah. the Queen's coffin at, at Windsor. What they've got, you know, they've got the whole royal stud at Sandringham. You know, it's huge. Well, John Warren looks after that, horses. and he's he's her kind of um, manager for all the racing needs. An and equestrian. He, and he's been on TV quite a lot over the past week. I think well, he's, he's a great very guy. keen to encourage Charles and Camilla to uh, yes. take over with enthusiasm. And this wow. is, a, you know, it's also um, a great source of wealth because some of these are really almost priceless animals, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Fascinating. One more question. The second one comes from Vicky French, who asks, do the Prince and Princess of Wales have a ceremony themselves? I'm presuming she means like an investiture or... What's the answer there? Um, yeah, I mean, this is really interesting, and we don't know yet when it's going to be. Mm. But, um, you know, older viewers might remember Prince Charles's investiture as the Prince of Wales. You know, it was a, it was a huge event, and he went to study Welsh first so that he could I speak saw it on in the Welsh. Crown. Yeah, well, this is something you saw the <laughs> yeah. Crown's version. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, when will Prince William learn Welsh? And I expect this won't be for some time. Perhaps it will be after the coronation. But it's, it's a very important role. And I think, you know, maybe it'll be at Carnarvon Castle again. And it will be another great spectacle to, to see. There you go, Vicky. You've got your answer. Well, do keep your questions coming in. You can leave a comment on social media or drop us an email on palace at mailplus.co.uk.
This Saturday, be sure to check out the Daily Mail, which will be running a beautiful supplement of photographs called Elizabeth the Great. We'll leave you with some of the amazing images you can look forward to from that. Just time to say thank you to my guests, Kate Manzi, Sarah Vine and Richard Eden, and of course to you for watching. Bye-bye.